Welcome to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. I am the host, Attorney John Kasravi, and I practice U.S. immigration law exclusively. For more information about the program, please visit www.immigrationlawyerspodcast.com. Please note that this recording is informational only and does not constitute legal advice. Please consult with a licensed attorney for specific legal guidance that suits your case. Also, this recording is copyrighted and written permission is required for rebroadcasting. For more information about me, please visit www.jqklaw.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 44 of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast covering June 5th to June 11, 2017. It's been a pretty fun week, pretty busy. A lot of interesting things have happened, as usual, that I'm going to go over and just talk about you know, my practice and some things I've deal with. Something I talked about last week that it was kind of fun for me because it's kind of uh, had some stuff that goes on in my head is reasons why people need immigration attorneys. And this week, I saw two scenarios that come up a lot and are the two main things I see repeatedly uh, where people have problems when they don't hire an immigration attorney. One is regards to family-based petitions, uh, and, and specifically during consular processing and doing the affidavit of support, the requirement that the petitioner and the this affidavit sponsor be domiciled within the United States. This frequently happens where people are filing the case on their own, aren't familiar with the domicile requirement, and they have their U.S. petitioner and the and the joint sponsor. Uh, not potentially in the United States and domiciled there, causing their application to have problems and a potential denial. I got a call on that this week to say what can we do to fix it and stuff, and I have to have a consultation with that. The second biggest one that comes is for naturalization, and it's really simple. People don't read or write English or speak English, and they fail the test. Now, there are exceptions where if a person's been the U a green card holder in the U.S. for many years, um, they could potentially not have to do uh, the language test or if they have certain medical conditions. But more often than not, the people are healthy, they just came to the U.S. as adults, never learned the English language. And they call me, uh, in, in this particular case, I got a call from a son where his two parents went, gave the application, paid the filing fees, went to the interview, but couldn't speak with the officer and consequently were denied. Well, the, again, these are things that a quick consultation, not even having an attorney uh, be hired for the case could have helped them out and avoided paying, you know, the seven hundred and twenty-five dollars per application, the months and months of time wasted going to an interview in downtown, you know, pay for parking even. If they just spoke with an attorney and the attorney just quickly spoke English with them and realized these people can't pass the test with their minimum language skills, there's no point in even filing the application in such a case. So those are two things that come up a lot. I'm sure you deal with them a lot as well. Uh, they're simple things, but you know, a simple conversation at the minimum with a lawyer uh, would have solved that. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but it would. There was a third one that came up. Unfortunately, I forgot to take notes on what the issue was, and I can't recall exactly. But there's just uh, these small stuff that you know you wouldn't think you even need a lawyer for them. But just speaking with an attorney, very minimum, or going with them is going to be so much more helpful and save you so much more time. Uh, a big issue I had this week is with regards to the, the new form 5535, it's a DS5535, it's a visa supplement uh, that's coming out, just been rolled out and, and uh, essentially it just asks for more information, particularly about social media, but also you know sibling history and all this kind of stuff for people that are getting a green card through consular processing. So I had a case, uh, a husband and wife on Monday went to uh, Abu Dhabi to do their consular processing. The wife's uh, case went to administrative processing um, and it's on hold. The husband did as well, but the husband got an email uh, within 24 hours that said, you need a complete form 5535. Now, so they didn't require it from the wife, but they did from the husband, which was interesting. But uh, it's something that we have to always prepare for now, uh, particularly if we're dealing with cases from the Middle East or countries that may have issues. But this creates another problem. Uh, as is usual, most immigration attorneys are, are flat rate fees. But when we have uh, additional work just pops up, like new administration comes and creates all sorts of issues, and there's unknown administrative, administrative processing delays where the people might want to follow up with the embassy or they want, might want you to help contact the congressperson and all that kind of stuff, there's always the extra work that comes up, uh, and it takes time to go back and forth with a client. Now, my previous contracts, my up till now, I haven't had a, a really space to... to uh, delineate and, and specify this issue. Uh, so I'm not going to charge it. Plus, I, it's hard for me to go back and charge clients now if things gone.
But I'm going to add uh, inf language to my contracts, and I suggest everyone else does too if they haven't already, which I'm assuming a lot of people have, that if new regulatory things pop up, new administration things pop up, or unknowns pop up that aren't part of the regular process like this, there has to be additional legal fees. Because uh, between this and two or three other cases that are having unnecessary issues at the consular processing stage that weren't expected or unknown, it creates many hours of work. It just fills up time that I, I don't have and it causes just a lot of pressure on my firm. So that's something that uh, it has to happen. Like we have to include language in the contract that specifies if something new pops up, um, it has to be specific language. Clients probably are not gonna like that, but it has to be in there. And along with that, there's there's a fee increase that I'm instituting across the board on a lot of my cases, uh, case types, just because between USCIS and the Department of State, there's so much more little things they have to do and back and forth that has to be done. Um, unnecessary RFEs that are popping up that are easy, it shouldn't even come out, they're easy fixes, but it still takes time to deal with those. That a contract has to it has to specify these things. I know those who have uh, hourly fee structures don't even have to worry about this. And a lot of immigration law firms don't do that, but the last Yale conference, there was a firm talking about a guy saying how he does hourly and it's changed everything, it's really good. That might be a way to do it. I've started tracking my hours uh, just so I have an idea how much time I'm spending on each case. Um, but it's kind of just hard uh, on clients to know that there is like an hourly fee structure. Maybe they can be an hourly with a ceiling that's higher than what your flat rate would be. Um, maybe you have a minimum flat rate and then after that it becomes hourly to that ceiling. Or maybe these kind of systems. But those are hard to explain to the client. So for now, uh, just a fee increase that will hopefully um, have to kind of estimate how much I think a certain case will take. And sometimes, you know, a case will take more time, sometimes less, and hopefully in the general amount of cases you do, things balance out. So that might be a suggestion for that. If you have other ideas or how you do it with regards to this issue, please email me and let me know. It's something I like to talk about. Uh, when it comes down to it, it, where I have a business and having a proper fee structure, uh, how payment is made and how our time is uh, spread out, uh, is something that's gonna be very important. Because keep in mind, it's not necessarily about the money, but you know, the more time you're spending on cases, especially when I get paid for, that's time that can be spent on a pro bono case or helping someone else to low bono and, and charging less. So, you know, if, if you have some rich client that's really not paying for all these additional services, that takes away time from someone who is needy that could do it. So it's very important that we look into that. Another interesting issue that's popping up, uh, and we had uh, in Southern California, we just had our annual uh, state of the district meeting, and a couple of members rose their hands to this and spoke about uh, petitioners being asked to bring police reports and RFEs are after the interview. Now, these are petitioners that don't have uh, Adam Walsh case issues, you know, some sort of, you know, sexual uh, violence or arrest or something like that. Uh, but the, uh, the petitioner, they're asking the petitioners to bring a criminal record, which is uh, kind of difficult. You know, if the petitioner li lived outside the country, it's going to be hard for them to get that. And in general, these cases that they were speaking about didn't require it. So it's kind of weird that the field office in particular is asking for these kind of documents. In general, you see a lot of different things pop up where especially new officers ask questions and go into details that aren't that necessary or are or shouldn't be issues, especially for example, in an adjustment of status on a marriage case. Uh, that's something we have to really push back on. If you've seen kind of weird issues like that pop up, let me know. Um, maybe we can get the information together on a national level and push back uh, from these kind of questions they're asking. An interesting program that the DHS is starting under CBP is testing out an exit program for called the Facial Recognition Biometric Exit Technology Program. So essentially, you know, we have stamps that are coming in. I think they want to do it going out as well. Uh, it's just going to be a test case in Washington, D.C. at the Dulles Airport for a trip from Dulles to Dubai, one trip a day. Um, they're also instituting programs where you don't need to get tickets necessarily to go to CB through through all the security apparatus they are, but some sort of facial recognition program will take care of that with you. They're still testing that stuff out. But it'll be interesting to see how that, that, that goes out. Uh, but in line with talking with CBP, uh, a disheartening thing that's being spoken about is, and I've talked about this before in the past, but it gets getting more real, is lowering the CBP testing standards so that uh, border protection officers will have an easier time being hired and, and sent to the field. This is extremely dangerous thing to have. Uh, this is one area where we can't lower the standards. Uh, border protection is such a security, sensitive security place, sensitive to you know, both terrorism issues and sensitive towards immigration issues that we have to have the highest caliber of people involved. 
Even Ayla put out a, a memo on this uh, and a talking points and, and wants people to contact the Congress people and do whatever politically they can to push back on this. CBP is a very difficult position. Uh, both, you know, it's a policing authority, so they have to be physically fit, mentally fit, all that kind of stuff. Um, they also have to have a very, very clear background because it's so easy to have be corrupt and, and be bribed as an officer there because there's so much power that they have. But then they, they, they deal with thousands of people on a constant basis every day at the airports, every day at the borders. Uh, and these are people in sensitive areas that don't have a right to an attorney. So we need to have the best of the best in these kind of positions. We can't do anything less than that. So that's something I, I uh, tell all of you, if you can, contact your Congress people to, to fight any lowering of the standard uh, for CBP officers. Uh, and if you have any ideas on how to deal with that, please email me. Again, my email is info at jqklaw.com. Another cool thing that came up, a bill in Congress was introduced called, uh, it's called Staple Act, but stopping trained in America PhDs from leaving the economy. So they always get creative with how they break down these things. But essentially it says this, if you're a STEM PhD, you shouldn't have the numerical limitations of the H1B or the numerical limitations of the like EB2 category to hold you back, you know, for China, India, those kind of cases, uh, H1B and just in general. So that's actually a wonderful thing. If someone, if through the US education system, someone has a PhD, which is extremely difficult to get, requires a lot of work, why are we sending him outside of the country? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Even if you hate immigrants, uh, I mean, these are people that have hundreds of thousands of dollars in training in them. You know, like for them to come where they are, probably half a million to a million dollars has been spent either in the U.S. or globally altogether to create a trained individual. And then we just take that trained individual and we just kick him out. It's it's ridiculous. So that's something to support uh, to definitely keep our PhDs here, it's going to give us a cutting edge and it's better they'd be in America, frankly, than a lot of other places that as bad as uh, some certain human rights abuse happen in the U.S., it's still better than pretty much everywhere else in the world. So it's better we have the best of the best here and have them uh, develop our civilization and society to the greatest extent possible. But speaking of those kind of, uh, you know, PERM and, and Department of Labor type cases, Department of Labor issued a statement saying it's increasing visa fraud and abuse review, uh, which... On its face, it's good. Uh, there is abuse in these categories, EB2, EB3, H1B. But my guess is uh, the fraud and abuse is going to go after. It's going to be small guys who aren't really doing abuse, not the big ones. That's how it usually happens when there's these kind of crackdowns. Now, that's about it for the big news kind of stuff. Uh, I had an interesting way. I created or I hooked up two people uh, to find jobs in the immigration field, which is wonderful. Really, as a it was was really made them happy, and I was really happy about that. I also had two interviews this week at the USCIS field office locally in Los Angeles. One thing you see when you go to field offices, especially in Southern California, I'm not sure if it's happening in other areas, but we have a lot of turnover. It, there's constantly new officers reviewing applications, and it's hard to, to get some rapport of meeting the same people and let them know who I am and how my cases are and everything, because it's constantly new people which is difficult because when there are new people, I, I don't believe they can make decisions on their own. They have to have a supervisory review, which is good, but it causes delays on the case because when they can't make the decision there, we have to sit on it and then wait and wait and wait for a supervisor to review it and then do it. And it gets the clients worried, it gets them paranoid, and sometimes they ask for, again, as I talked about before, the RFE things that shouldn't be RFE, uh, which cause delays if they go back and mail it to them or show them, and that kind of stuff. So it's kind of hard, but one note, uh, one thing I am uh, doing to in that general process is when I email my clients as a reminder, and I, I send a reminder for the interview of what to do, like, you know, get there early, dress nice. Uh, I'll be meeting them at the interview like half an hour earlier in the room. We'll send talk and everything. But also include the, the parking directions for the most affordable yet closest parking to the field office. Because, for example, in LA, they have a parking that's directly across from the field office, which is faster, but it's much more expensive. There's no, another one, you know, uh, you know, a block away or half a block away that's uh, easier to park and much cheaper. These are little things you could do to uh, make the customer service experience better with your clients. And in line with that, uh, my wife just started watching this TV show. It's apparently been around for eight years, but she just caught on, you know, watching season after season. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's some doctor who gets you know kicked out of a hospital, and the doctor starts uh, goes to the Hamptons for a vacation and becomes like a concierge private doctor there 
for the rich. Uh, but eventually, because he's helping the rich, he's also helping the you know, poor people in Hamptons who do the daily work there and the grind and everything. And that's kind of how I've designed my office with this con kind of concierge service where you know I help uh, you know investor cases stuff like that, which are higher ticket items. But it gives me the time to do you know, educational programs, do talks like this with fellow attorneys, uh, and to take on low bono cases when or pro bono cases when you know clients just come to me and I, I like their story, I like who they are, I want to do what I can. So that's one thing to do. Uh, use the regular clients and bigger ticket clients to subsidize the other ones. Uh, and that's a way to really balance it out and have your firm be representative of the populations um, you want to help. So that's something to think about. You know, I had a, finally, I had a, a lot of things I wanted to talk about uh, that would come up during the week, but I was so busy. I usually take notes as I'm thinking about things so that I can <laughs> pile them up on Sunday and talk about them. But there are two or three really interesting stuff I wanted to talk about, but fortunately, I didn't take the notes and I can't recall them now. It's just been a really heavy week, and the terrible thing is I work a lot now, but when like the weekend rolls around on Saturday, I just fall asleep and I'm dead tired all day. I don't drink coffee and I don't drink Red Bull or anything like that. I just don't want to get hooked on that kind of stuff. But uh, sometimes I wonder if I did that kind of stuff, would it, would it give me more energy or would it just break my body down faster by keeping me up artificially for so long? One thing uh, I am moving forward is the program of getting uh, you know attorneys, non-immigration uh, attorneys to help people that are stuck in immigration court that don't have representation, in particular children. So I've spoken with a couple of attorneys across the country and bar organizations all over the place to get their members involved and then connecting them for the education process. So that's moving forward well. One issue and question that's valid that's come up is, um, is it safe to have you know non-immigration attorneys uh, participating in this process? My thing is, you know, if, if the people aren't gonna have any attorney, it's better to have some attorney. But at the same time, secondly, they're going to be trained and they should have some sort of supervision or some kind of mentoring attorney that could be watching over them and helping in the process to make sure uh, things aren't going bad. Uh, in the end, it's, it's worth it to have them do that. Now, a thing that just popped in my head is, um, is this going to worry you know, practitioners that do removal proceedings as part of their you know, work that you know, some other person is going to be doing for free, where, whereas they get paid for it? Is that going to create competition um, and take away cases? Uh, that's just something that popped in my head, you know, right now when I was talking about this. Uh, you know, my thing is these are people are going to get these these non-immigration attorneys are people that wouldn't get a regular immigration attorney anyways. They're people that go to court without any sort of representation. So in that case, it doesn't really matter. Um, and plus, you know, if someone has the money and at the beginning we tell them, you know, this person isn't an immigration attorney; they're here to do pro bono work. Uh, if they had the money, they probably have more sense to just hire somebody that does immigration uh, full time to, to do hopefully the best job possible. Although there's a lot of full time removal attorneys that are doing terrible jobs, but uh, it's an option. Really, I want to reserve a start out with the kids, and then move to other other areas uh, just because of of the need for it and everything. But uh, it's a fun topic. I'm still trying to figure out between my schedule uh, um, of how busy I am and, and connecting with other people and setting up the education training but really to put the logistics together. So if you're doing something like this or thinking about it, you know, just give me a call or email me. I can talk about it and get it started in your area. I guess the best way is to contact the local bar organizations that you're, you work with or you have friends in. Um, contact the local pro bono immigration clinics uh, and see if they can help with the training. And they already have the clients there. So I think it's a very noble program to, to institute in whatever jurisdiction you're at. Uh, to help people that don't have representation. That's the essence of America, is having representation before the government, and that's what guarantees our freedom in general uh, with, all, with all Americans. So uh, that's about it for today, that's the week. I hope you have a great one. Summer's here, so it's been particularly hot everywhere, but uh, hopefully you're inside and with the AC and having a good time. This was the Immigration Lawyers Podcast, episode 44. Please email me if you had any questions or comments. Uh, my email is info at jqklaw.com. The ALA conference is coming up very soon in New Orleans. I have a, I'm giving a talk at one conference, which I still need to finalize. I've been putting it off, but I need to finalize my part of it. I'm also giving a brunch uh, speech or something like that about uh, marketing. It's called uh, Modern Immigration Practice and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty much similar stuff I talk about on here but to a group that's doing brunch in New Orleans. I'm also speaking at the law student seminar, or law student 
conference on the first day so it'll be fun i hope i can see you all there uh please if you see me walking and this and there i do have a video of every recording i do almost every recording if it's not an interview um and i post it on the a new youtube page i created i don't know what the name of it is but uh if you email me and you're on the there is a i do a newsletter for this podcast that includes other information so on a monthly newsletter you'll see the videos and links to it you can always add uh that and subscribe to that youtube page to see the video and you'll see how I look and uh, feel free to stop by stop me if you see me in New Orleans I love to talk to you get to know you share cards and just keep the communication alive uh, that's it for this week I hope you enjoyed it until next time have a great week bye bye